was the first time I can remember getting very emotional about watching a horse race. I was only about 15 at the time, but it made an impression. <laughs> and, and what about your first job in racing? How did you actually get into the racing industry as a broadcaster or a writer? My God. Well, that was, I, I, do you know what? When I was at university at Keele, um, that academic hothouse on the M6, you know, behind the <laughs> services. <laughs> I read um, economics and history there. But at the same time, I was always thinking I would love to become a sports journalist. I mean, it wasn't just racing I loved. I, I, I love all sports, really. But racing in particular was my first love. Um, anyway, I got a job when I left Keele as a government auditor. I mean, how boring is that for the Exchequer and Audit Department? Rather different from <laughs> what you're doing now, I guess. <laughs> Well, it was. I mean, it's just like, I mean, I, I had a girlfriend that lived in London at the time. I wanted to be in town in London. And I remember one day when I was at an unemployment benefit office helping out behind the scenes there in Islington, looking through these windows, which had bullet holes in them. I kid you not, thinking, what am I doing here? And um, one day, shortly after that, there was, I got the Sporting Life every day. And I was reading the life and there was an advert in there for an editorial assistance job at uh, Timeform. So I applied for that and uh, I got the opportunity. Reg Griffin went to meet Reg and uh, I got offered a job at Timeform and the, the dream had started. I mean, I couldn't quite believe it at the time, but uh, going up to Timeform in Halifax was, a, was an extraordinary experience. I, that, that, that was the end of me. And, and I guess, was Jim, Jim McGraw around then as well? You, so you mentioned Reg Griffin. Was Jim, did you meet Jim there? I did, yeah. Jim, um, J- Jim was, was around then, absolutely. And... Uh, it was funny because Jim was quite a quite a quite aloof while I worked at Timeform. Um, he didn't really give me a lot of time, but at the same time, I, it, he took a bit of getting to know. I'm, I'm glad to, to to report after 30 odd years, we're good mates. Uh, I had massive respect for Jim. He I, having a young upstart like me asking him questions and stuff was probably not what he wanted to hear. But I mean, Jim was an extraordinary and is an extraordinary race reader and interpreter of form. Um, and he was a very busy guy at the time, Jimmy. He, he was working on Channel 4 Racing. He was TVAM's uh, racing correspondent as well. Do you remember that on, in the mornings? Yes, yes. Yeah, so in the end, Jim actually helped me get the job as Willie Carson's agent down the line. But that was that was a few years later on. And and what about your current role? T- t- tell the listeners what, what you currently do. I'm sure you've got more than one hat, but uh, tell us <laughs> what you currently do. Well, at the moment, um, I mean, I can't believe it. it's 10 years now since we stopped broadcasting on, on Channel 4 Racing, the old high fly team. 2012, that all ended. Is that right? 10 years? Wow. Yeah, it's it amazing, Simon. Gosh. Um, I still get people coming up to me saying, we miss you boys on the on the TV. We were a good team, I think. We, we, we bounced off each other well in those days. So now I'm a horse racing commentator for Race Tech on the track. And I do a few days a month as well, presenting for Sky Sports Racing. So, yeah, very lucky to still be involved. And, and a question I've always wanted to ask you, really, is do you enjoy commentating or interviewing more? Because you presumably do both. Um, mm. is, is, do you have a preference or not? It's a great question. And I've often thought about it. I, I like the variety in my job, Simon. That's what I love. I mean, that's, it, it's no coincidence that I did a, I did a dual degree because... I'm a little bit, um, I'm a bit fickle like that. And I, and I like having different things to get stuck into. So doing a bit of presenting, um, well, either in the studio or out, you know, on the track, um, compared to commentating, the, calling the horses, it, it, they're both quite different mediums. I suppose because the commentating thing is, it's, it's just you on your own most of the time. Well, it is you on your own as a presenter, effectively. You've just got to that moment you've got to call that race you get one one crack at it i like that adrenaline rush that i get from doing a a race call i get a little bit of an adrenaline rush doing a live broadcast as well but it's not the same as calling a race particularly a big race okay and and talking of commentating uh are you are you more of a flat or a jumps man and are there different challenges and approaches when you're commentating on a flat or a jumps race I would say yes, definitely, um, different challenges. Um, the flat racing tends to be, uh, it happens much, much more quickly. Um, and therefore, looking down at your notes and your colour charts probably is not a great idea when you're commentating on a flat race. But if you've got a big field over the jumps and you, you haven't quite 
embedded all those colours in your head or whatever, you've still got a chance to look down at your, 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 your clipboard and pick it up. It's a slower pace over jumps. I say that, Simon, but I, I did three Grand Nationals and that was quick as any sprint I've ever done. I couldn't believe how quickly they jumped those fences. Uh, honestly, you're just picking up the fallers and the unseats from one fence and they've already jumped the next. <laughs> Changing tack a little bit, Mike. Um, uh, obviously, um, we Simon and I set this up because we're both involved in running syndicates and syndicate ownership. Um, and that's really sort of why we, we wanted to have a podcast to promote shared ownership. I'm interested to know if you've ever been involved in ownership or syndication. Yes, Phil, I have. And uh, I was very lucky to be part of a group of about eight of us who were who shared the ownership of um, Australia Day. It was a, a really nice, lovely Bonnie Grey horse front runner who was a pretty good hurdler and chaser and also quite talented on the flat, trained by Paul Weber a few years ago. Uh, so so successful was he that, I mean, our bills were pretty limited. Um, and at the time, I, I had so much fun with all these other guys that were involved. There were a couple of close mates uh, in the syndicate too, but others I didn't know so well. But... I cannot recommend a syndicate-owned horse highly enough. It's great fun. The The expense is, is much reduced from owning it yourself. And you can share the experiences, the highs and the lows, the frustrations and the the, the, the dreams that you, you can share. And, and you never lose those those moments. I, honestly, if I could put a syndicate together now, um, I, I would do it at a drop of a hat. It just brings so much pleasure. It really does. Mike, Mike I, I remember Australia Day. Wasn't he a real tearaway at his fences? Yeah, he was. He was. He was indeed. I bet you had your heart in your mouth whenever you saw him race. Do you know what? I'll tell you something, uh, Simon. One day he was taking on catch it over hurdles. in the. It was a, it was a listed uh, hurdle race at Kempton in October, start of the season. And catch it had won his champion hurdle and was perhaps on a downgrade by then. But Australia Day, he was very, very smart going right-handed. He was two to one on to win this. I was commentating that day. And I was a nervous wreck. And I'll never forget <laughs> thinking, I mean, he won. Thank God he won. But And Dennis O'Regan was on him, gave him a super ride. He was a tearaway. Dennis had great hands. So you never, your heart was in your mouth every time he jumped a fence because he was going at such a great pace. And he held the track record at Kempton for quite a number of years. Um, but I remember thinking, uh, how did Peter O'Sullivan do it when he called home the likes of Ativo and Be Friendly all those yes. years ago. When, yes. You know, he had, he owned, owned those horses outright and he was on national television. So fair play to old Peter. And, and you'd never have known, would you? He was very professional. Nope. You wouldn't have known that he owned it, would you, Ativo? A hundred percent. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, what a pro. We were going to ask you, Mike, what, what you were going to say to somebody that was thinking of getting involved in a syndicate. But I think you pretty much covered that with all the enthusiasm. You, you clearly share the same enthusiasm for the whole the whole sort of experience that Simon and I do. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for that. That was that was really good to hear. Well, no, guys, and you, and you do it well too. You know, you've got a great track record with it and all power to you for carrying on with that. Now, now, Mike, you're the, the, the consummate easygoing, if I may say so, broadcaster. <laughs> but but, well, but, but you. Can, you, can, can you give us an embarrassing interview or commentating story? <laughs> Perhaps something that maybe could have gone a bit differently from you'd envisaged. Oh, yeah, 100%, Simon. There's plenty of those. Um, okay, well, I mean, that's far kind of, away, far away. Yeah. Well, it's funny because Jim McGrath, Timeform Jim McGrath, as opposed to Aussie Jim, uh, both of them are good mates of mine. Um, Timeform Jim always loves ripping the mickey out of me for the moments on Channel 4 Racing where I put my foot in it or found myself in a tricky situation. And one of which was Jumbo International Day at York. And for the first time ever, Carla Dalla had actually managed to win his own race. He won it with um, twice over and he, he beat midday. It was a one-two for Henry, Henry Cecil. Yeah. And I found myself, I was there and the winner, Andrew Franklin, the producer said to me, he said, okay, Mike, it's all yours. And I found myself right opposite Prince Carla Abdullah. And I said, um, hello, sir. Um, many congratulations. At long last, you've managed to win your own race. And it, it as complete silence came back at me, he looked at me and nothing came back. And I thought, that's strange. So I then I changed it. To, I said, not only that, you've managed to get a one-two. And again, complete silence. And then I thought, well, what am I going to say now? And I said, well, and even more so, uh, Your Highness, trained by your great friend, Sir Henry Cecil. And again, silence. Then he said to me, he looked at me, he said, what is your question? <laughs> and I was completely <laughs> taken aback. And a few moments later, 
A few moments later, a load of jockeys are coming in for the next race, led by Richard Hughes, who at the time was the prince's retained rider, or just, you know, you know. And he was killing himself laughing with a few of the other boys going past us. And Hughesy said, as he went past, said, you won't be trying that again in a hurry now, will you? And I said, well, <laughs> what was that all about? What had happened? He said, he's f- deaf, he said. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I didn't know. I hadn't a clue why no one had interviewed him before because he, he hadn't done many interviews, the Prince, and I hadn't realised it's because he was hard of hearing. So, oh, that was a shocker. Oh, dear. <laughs> what a great story, Mike. <laughs> I didn't see that punchline coming at all. Fantastic. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, dear. That was one that will go with me, that one. Okay, and, and, and look, can you mention maybe a couple of people you've interviewed who surprised you? Maybe you thought they might be a bit difficult or reluctant. I mean, for example, I know Sir Michael Stout people think, think is quite difficult, but actually apparently he's got a great sense of humour and is good fun. Uh, any, any people you've interviewed who turn out to be better than you anticipated, maybe? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, another great question which had me thinking, actually. Um, I mean, I occasionally when you're at the, the big meetings, particularly when we're doing Channel 4, you get a chance to interview various celebrities who um, come and talk to you. And some of them are a lot more shy than you might imagine. I remember I, I did an interview with uh, uh, Tom Hardy, the actor, wonderful actor, who was really shy. Um, and it just took me by surprise. I found myself really trying to dig to get something out of him. And then on the other hand, I'll never forget, um, the, the, the floor manager came up to me and said... Um, We've got Scylla Black here, Mike. Um, tell Andrew, the producer, we've got Scylla Black waiting to be interviewed. Now, I couldn't remember whether Scylla was Dame Scylla or not. And I thought, oh, my God. And I heard she was a bit of a diva. So just to play it on the safe side, I said to Andrew, um, and she was standing next to me as I said this, I said, Andrew, we've got Dame Scylla Black uh, standing next to me. Wait, can we talk to her? And, and Dame Scylla, oh, I thought she was, she said, oh, I love you, because she wasn't Dame Scylla. <laughs> but because I referred to her as Dame Scylla, she then gave me a fantastic interview. She was a great company, <laughs> which wasn't always the case, I understand, but you never know, do you? So if in doubt, make sure you give them a title, you know, to, to, yes. to, to, to Flatt- get them on your side. Flattery gets you everywhere, guys. I tell you, it really does. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's, that's, that's lovely. Um and, and, and look, one, one question, uh, we could be here all morning uh, talking about various anecdotes, Mike, but I know you're very busy. But one thing we like to finish with is to ask people in racing, what are the three things that if you had a magic wand, you could change mm. for the better in British racing? What would oh, they be? Oh, jeez, jeez. A magic wand. Yeah, well. Only three, by the way. <laughs> I know. <laughs> We'd have a hell of a list, guys, wouldn't we? Um, well, I mean, look, the, the, the funding mechanism. You'd change that at the drop of a hat, wouldn't you? You'd have a tote monopoly, as they have in France, um, uh, because that, that's a funding mechanism that works superbly well. I mean, that's that, but that will never happen. That, 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 that's long, long gone. Um, the other thing I would do, I'd cut, down the, um, I'd cut down the fixture list. It was way, way too much racing. Very topical, isn't it, at the moment? Very topical. And, and, and everybody's screaming and saying the same thing, aren't they? Or virtually everybody, I think. Yeah, I think so. And I can't quite understand why the BHA um, got cold feet recently when they, they could easily have cut 300 fixtures and they, they decided not to. And it's poor leadership. It's weak leadership. Uh, and they've, the BHA has really got to get, get a grip of this. Uh, the other thing what I would do to make things better would be to massively reduce... Um, uh, the entry entry um, fees to get into racecourse racecourses they're way too expensive. That's interesting. That's some that's that's not something anybody's mentioned before. That's interesting, Mike. Yeah, Are you talking generally, not not just the big meetings generally. Yeah, across the whole spectrum, I would take it uh, take it right back. I mean, you can get into the uh, the big meetings in France for nothing. Likewise, in Australia, although it's been a long time since I've been in Australia now, but uh, I remember thinking at the time, goodness me, it shows us up badly. But when you when you're talking about spending, if you're going as a couple to t- something like Ascot and you're spending hundreds just to get in, then something's not right. And I just think that um, if you can encourage people to just go and experience what a great sport this is, they'll 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 get their profits from the drinks and the and the the food that people will buy and eat and stuff and drink. Um, but I'd even have certain days free entry. I really would. Listen, thanks again, Mike. Really appreciate your time. I know you're very busy and we really appreciate you having you on Inside the Rails. Thank you.
Oh, Simon and Phil, it's a pleasure. I've, I'm, I'm privileged and uh, honoured to be asked. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Well, Phil, another great guest. What a nice